There are three things you really need to know about comics in the 90s, right? One, the decade kicked off with a massive market boom, fueled by superstar artists, a growing focus on collectability, and the high-profile sales of rare vintage comics such as Action Comics Issue 1, Superman's debut, which fetched over a million dollars. Two, this speculation bubble paved the way for the emergence of indie publisher Image Comics in 1992, while the established old guard DC received mainstream press with blockbuster events including the death of Superman. And then three, what goes up must come down, and this market saturation led to a subsequent bust, marked by industry leader Marvel filing for bankruptcy in 1996 and comic sales plummeting across the board. But within that five to six year period, we got a boatload of first appearances, new number ones, status quo shifts, gimmick covers, and believe it or not, some genuinely great comic books. Hey heroes, I'm Josh from Panels to Pixels, and today I'm digging through my short box to show you the 20 most important comics of the 90s. Important is kind of a nebulous term when it comes to evaluating art. What's important to me might not be important to you, and vice versa. So for this video, I looked at the publicly available data of comic book grading company CGC to identify the most commonly submitted 90s comics. We're talking first appearances, event books, mainstream superhero stuff. I wanted to see what the comic community at large deemed to be the most important comics, the most worthy of preservation. So let's kick things off with number 20 on my list, and this one goes to Superman the Man of Steel issue number 18, cover dated December 1992. And this one is notable as the first full appearance of Doomsday. And I say full appearance because the character, you know, first appeared in a cameo appearance in issue number 17, and um, here in issue number 18, it's counted as his first full appearance, but he's still in the containment suit. Uh, it's only the, an issue later in issue 19 that um, you see him in all his stony, spiky 90s glory. So Doomsday is one of those rare villains who kind of came out of nowhere in the 90s and cemented themselves as a mainstay of Superman's Rose Gallery. And that's because he came out of nowhere and killed Superman. This was part of the death of Superman story. And I mentioned in the intro that this was a really high profile event. This broke through to the mainstream. This was widely reported in the news media in America because Superman is famously overpowered. He's invincible. So for a total new guy to come in and dethrone the king, it was a big deal. And it made Doomsday, you know, an iconic 90s Superman villain. And that's why this easily ranks amongst the most important comics of the 90s. In at number 19, we've got some Rob Liefeld and writer Fabian Nicieza action here in X-Force, issue 11, cover dated June 1992. And this is um, significant as the first full appearance of Domino. You see Domino on the cover there, and this one gets a little bit messy because Domino had appeared in X-Force comics up to this point, but it was here that it was revealed that that had been an imposter, uh, Vanessa, the love interest of uh, Deadpool that you might know from the movie. She'd been posing as Domino, but here we get the full backstory to that, and, um, and so this is counted as the first real appearance of Domino. In at number 18, we've got Batman Vengeance of Bane, issue one, cover dated January 1993. Another huge DC first appearance of an iconic 90s villain. So this one is the first appearance and origin of Bane, and it kicked off the popular, very popular Nightfall series. This is one of the most legendary Batman stories, and it was another one of those really highly publicized um, DC epics of the 90s. You had the death of Superman, and you had Nightfall, which was kind of the death of the idea of Batman. He didn't actually die, he got his bat broken, he had to retire, it's a whole thing. But Bane's introduction in this issue made such a big impact, you know, he wasn't just a villain of the week, he got a really well-crafted, well-thought-out origin in this story, and because of that he went on to star in movies and in Batman the Animated Series. So as you're gonna see, there really aren't that many DC comics that rank amongst the, the big hitters from Marvel in the 90s, but the introduction of Bane is way up there. In at number 17, we've talked about some Marvel, we've talked about some DC, so now let's talk about some of the other indie publishers that, you know, were really there to make the 90s such a boom period. And so this from Valiant Comics is Rye, issue zero, cover dated November 1992. And this one is the first full appearance and origin of Bloodshot. 
Yes, Bloodshot, the star of the, what was it, 2020 movie starring Vin Diesel? <laughs> no, but seriously, Bloodshot quickly became the headline act of the Valiant universe. And this story was critical in connecting all of the, uh, the different stories that was going on in the Valiant universe. And that cover is super iconic, right? It's really striking. It was designed by Jim Shooter, drawn by artist David Lapham, um, and it's actually a swipe of a Mike Zek Punisher piece. <laughs> so, a little bit of trivia for you there. At number 16, we've got to get back into the world of Rob Liefeld, you know, the Kirk Bain of comics. <laughs> and uh, we've got X-Force, issue two, cover dated September 1991. And this one is the second appearance of Deadpool. There he is. Um, Deadpool, obviously one of the breakout stars of 90s comics. Um, so it was worth including his second appearance here. Um, and also, you know, I would have included X-Force issue one, which sold crazy, I think over 5 million copies, um, but there aren't any first appearances of it. It's it's so easy to come by that it doesn't really rank very highly upon people who are wanting to get their comics graded. Um, but X-Force 2, you know, there you go. Star of the 90s, Deadpool, he's back again. At number 15, we've got Marvel Comics Presents issue 72, cover dated March 1991. And before Wolverine, there was Weapon X. This one is the origin of Wolverine, which had been a mystery since the character first appeared in Incredible Hulk issue 180 and 181 back in, what's that, 1974? This one's significant because Wolverine was the king of 90s comics. X-Men were at their all-time peak popularity. And, you know, <laughs> something about those metal claws that could um, stab and gouge and <laughs> disembowel. It was just popular with kids, okay? Kids are sick. He was just the right amount of edgy, and this uh, origin story really delves back into his tortured past. Marvel Comics Presents was actually an anthology series which featured um, several short stories. So this origin story by legendary comics artist Barry Windsor Smith ran across 13 issues. It was serialized in kind of little bite-sized chunks, and it's without a doubt one of the greatest comics of the 90s. When people write off 90s comics as being all style and no substance, show them this comic because it is just a feast for the eyes. Number 14 on our list goes to Spawn issue number 9, cover dated March 1993. So we're getting into some image stuff here, Todd McFarlane's Spawn. This one is the first appearance of Angela. A year into Todd McFarlane's creator-owned series, Spawn, he had the genius idea, from a marketing standpoint, of um, throwing a bunch of money at the four most esteemed writers in comics at the time. So we're talking Alan Moore, writer of Watchmen and countless other things, Frank Miller, creator of The Dark Knight Returns, and again, countless other things, Neil Gaiman, Sandman, and Dave Sim of Cerebus fame, which is like a huge, long-running um, indie epic. And they all wrote one issue each, and it's a really interesting kind of creative experiment because they all go in really different ways. Frank Miller's is really gritty and grounded, as you'd expect, and um, Alan Moore just goes <laughs> absolutely hog wild with all of this mythology. He adds a lot of mythology to the Spawn lore. Um, Neil Gaiman also added a lot. He introduced medieval Spawn and this character right here, Angela, which makes this a significant comic of the 90s. Now, you could argue that this is the most expensive comic ever produced because um, what ensued was <laughs> two decades, basically, of legal battles between Neil Gaiman and Todd McFarlane because they, the contract wasn't very secure about who owned the character of Angela. Um, there was a long-running legal battle, lots of legal fees. It ended in Todd McFarlane having to relinquish the rights to Angela as well as a load of money. <laughs> and um, Neil Gaiman later sold Angela to Marvel, who was introduced as Thor's half-sister. At number 13, we've got a cover that I don't have my hands on right now, I wish I did, but it's Uncanny X-Men issue 282, cover dated November 1991. And this is the first cover appearance and cameo appearance of Bishop. Bishop appears in the final panel of this comic, and what can you say about Bishop? He epitomizes 90s X-Men. There's all sorts of weird time travel stuff going on. His design, he's, you know, <laughs> built like a brick shit house with a huge gun. He's got one too many accessories, including that red bandana and the blue and yellow striped suit, which I believe was based on Gary Coleman, the child actor of different strokes fame. Uh, yeah, don't ask. <laughs> so Wills Portacio is the artist on this issue, one of the seven Image Comics founders. And, um, you know, that coupled with a major X-Men first appearance easily guarantees it a place on this list. At number 12, we've got the Infinity Gauntlet issue one, cover dated July 1991. And this is obviously the first issue that kicks off the popular six issue limited series, The Infinity Gauntlet, which had a huge effect on the entire Marvel Universe. This was one of the biggest wide line Marvel events of the 90s, and it's become super iconic. Obviously, uh, the popularity of this one has been bolstered somewhat by the Infinity Saga in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. 
But yeah, you all know how this one goes. Thanos assembles the six Infinity Gems and um, wipes out half of the world's population. Writer Jim Starlin continues to build on his little cosmic corner of the Marvel Universe, which he had established back in the 70s. Um, so there's something about this one that doesn't feel very 90s. I think a lot of people are surprised to learn that this is a 90s comic. It kind of does away with some of the excesses of the era. Um, so it's super timeless, super iconic now, thanks to the movies. It's the Infinity Gauntlet. At number 11, we return to the DC Universe with Batman Adventures issue 12, cover dated September 1993. And I say DC Universe, but this is actually the Batman the Animated Series Universe, or the, the DC Animated Universe. This one is notable as the first appearance of Harley Quinn in a standard comic book. If you didn't know, Harley Quinn was created by Bruce Timm and Paul Dini and originated in Batman the Animated Series. But here we see her for the first time in this comic based on the TV show. You know, this one is funny to me. I don't own a copy myself because it goes for quite a bit of money. It's one of the more expensive comics on this list. And, you know, that's not surprising. There are a lot of diehard Harley Quinn fans out there, but I don't know about this one. This isn't Harley Quinn's first appearance because she originated in a TV show and it's not her first appearance in the DC Comics universe because that would come later. So I don't know if this one deserves the hype necessarily or the, uh, the big books that it commands, but it definitely deserves a place on this list. So it's no surprise that I buy a lot of comics, and my favourite place to buy comics recently has been Whatnot. Whatnot is a fantastic app where you can shop for collectibles through live streams. And they've been helping me fill some gaps in my 90s comics collection by sponsoring my videos. I picked up a bunch of comics that I'm going to talk about in this video from Whatnot, and some that we've already touched upon, like my Rai issue zero and a couple of issues of X-Force. But I'm not done yet, I'm on Whatnot all the time now, getting into bidding wars, picking up those 90s key issues. And you can too, by using my link on screen now or in the description of this video. And just by signing up, you'll get a free £10 credit to spend on comics. So make sure you claim your free credit on Whatnot, buy some comics on me, and I'll catch you over there. But back to the video. In at number 10, we are traveling to the far-flung future of 2099 with a comic that I actually own this time, <laughs> Spider-Man 2099, issue number one, cover dated November 1992. And this one is the origin of the Spider-Man of 2099, Miguel O'Hara. It's not technically his first appearance in a comic. He featured in a preview in Amazing Spider-Man issue 365. But I think we can all agree that this is the introduction that Miguel O'Hara deserves. We've got that beautiful red foil cover. Spider-Man 2099 was always kind of the cool, edgy, alternative version of Spider-Man to be a fan of in the 90s. And his popularity has been boosted massively by the Spider-Verse movies, in which he's portrayed by Oscar Isaac. At number 9 we've got another Spider-Man title, but don't worry because the rest of the list is very X-Men heavy. <laughs> this is Spider-Man issue 1, cover dated August 1990. Artist Todd McFarlane had become a fan favourite on the Amazing Spider-Man series, introducing the character of Venom, and as he started to vie for more story control from writer David Michelinie, Marvel editorial said, you know what Todd, <laughs> just have your own series. And um, that gave us the adjectiveless Spider-Man title in 1990. So now with McFarlane drawing and writing, this new number one uh, launched Todd McFarlane to the top of the sales chart. Um, it sold millions of copies. It had a few um, variants. I've got the standard edition here, uh, but it had like a platinum edition, a silver edition, and uh, some of those like rare misprints can fetch a pretty penny. So look out for those. And yeah, this one, to me, Todd McFarlane is one of the most iconic artists of the 90s. Spider-Man was one of the most popular characters of, of all time, but of the 90s. And this was just McFarlane's playground. He was able to do whatever he wanted, draw all the crazy spaghetti webbing and the insane spidery poses, and, and just get very dark with it. Spider-Man got very dark at this time. And without this, Todd McFarlane stepping out on his own and proving that you don't need to be a good writer <laughs> to write a comic necessarily. You can still just make cool pictures and sell a bunch of comics. Um, that really <laughs> busts the dam wide open for Image Comics and you know a lot of those rock star artists of the 90s. At number eight, I told you we're getting into the X-Men universe and we're starting off with X-Men issue four, cover date is January 1992. And this is the first appearance of Omega Red, a, a really um, iconic 90s X-Men villain. Omega Red, a Russian serial killer, captured and experimented on by the government. He's got that fantastic Jim Lee design. He's a great foe to go up against Wolverine, you know, as I said, the king of the 90s. What more could you want? When you think of all those iconic X-Men bad guys, Magneto, Juggernaut, Sabretooth, Mystique, a lot of those were introduced 
a lot earlier, not many introduced in the 90s had such sticking power. So it's a testament to Omega Red's design, and just what a badass he is, that it cemented him as one of the X-Men villain A-listers right from the beginning. At number 7, one of my favourite comics of the 90s, introducing one of my favourite 90s characters, a character that just epitomises the 90s, is New Mutants issue 87, cover dated March 1990. So yeah, just sneaking in there at the beginning of the decade, this is of course the first full appearance of Cable, the time-travelling cyborg mutant, <laughs> just every character design trope you can throw at him, he's got it. I've got my slabbed copy back there, pride of place, on my shelf, I made a whole video about buying that on whatnot, and everything about this is just so 90s and so iconic, of course you've got the Rob Liefeld design, you've got the Rob Liefeld penciled cover with Todd McFarlane inks, that was my favourite um, penciling and inking combo at this period. What more can I say about New Mutants issue 87? At number 6 we've got the highest selling comic of all time, X-Men issue 1 from October 1991. And um, on top of being the first team appearances of the X-Men Gold and uh, Blue teams, this is also, you know, just <laughs> a new number one for the X-Men. It sold over 8 million copies, I think. It had a bunch of different variants. I've got two of my favourites here. This represented a changing of the guard for the X-Men. Chris Claremont, who had been the writer and really the custodian of the X-Men since the mid-70s, he ended his tenure with this story arc. An artist, Jim Lee, introduced a load of new costume designs for the X-Men and, and really cemented this as an artist-focused book for the rest of the decade. This defined what the X-Men looked like for the 90s, including in the X-Men animated series. As I said, 8 million copies sold. I'm sure you've got a few of these copies <laughs> somewhere in your house. Everyone needs a couple. It's just such a unique and, and milestone moment of 90s comics. At number 5, I alluded to this character earlier, one of the most popular characters of the 90s. We've got Venom, Lethal Protector, issue number 1, cover dated February 1993. So although Venom took over the 90s, he was easily the most popular Spider-Man villain, one of the most popular comics villains in general in the 90s. He actually was first introduced by Todd McFarlane and David Michelinie in Amazing Spider-Man issue 299, I think is technically his first appearance, back in 1988. So he's not even technically a 90s character. But still with that hulking design and the, the slimy symbiote and the, the gooey tongue and the, the big evil eyes, he was practically made for the 90s. And so Venom Lethal Protector was his first solo series. It sold a bunch of copies because it was part of that speculator boom. And it marks the character's transition from straight up villain to anti-hero. Anti-heroes were all the rage in the 90s. The Punisher, Spawn, Wolverine. And hey, how can I talk about this comic without mentioning the red holographics foil cover? Man, that thing is a stunner. But moving on to number four, and we're getting into the primo stuff here. This is Uncanny X-Men issue 266, cover dated August 1990. This one is a little bit contentious because it is technically the second appearance in publishing order of Gambit, but it's the first cover appearance and it's the first chronological appearance of Gambit in the story at least. The character technically first appeared on newsstands, if you like, in X-Men Annual Issue 14, which went on sale three weeks before this issue, but Uncanny X-Men Issue 266 was intended to be published first, to be the proper introduction of Gambit. Created by writer Chris Claremont and artist Mike Collins and Jim Lee, Gambit immediately became one of the breakout stars of 90s X-Men, and his costume is just a full-on <laughs> 90s assault with the trench coat and the face sock and everything else. Coming in at number 3, there is a comic that nobody can deny the importance of this character's introduction, even if, like me, you're not a particularly big fan. <laughs> this is New Mutants, issue 98, cover dated February 1991, and this is, of course, the first appearance of Deadpool. And yes, I know this is a facsimile edition, I can't afford the real thing, and as I said, not a huge Deadpool fan. But still, just 11 issues after the introduction of Cable, Rob Liefeld is back once again with the introduction of the Merc with the Mouth, Deadpool, a character whose popularity has just grown and grown and grown since the 90s. I think for a lot of people, Deadpool is the quintessential 90s character. He's edgy, he's got a ton of guns, he uh, kills people, he's an anti-hero, he's covered head to toe in pouches. Uh, so of course he had to rank high on this list. And this is a highly sought after first appearance, which when you consider the character's popularity is really no surprise. But moving on to number two, we have to talk about another character who really exemplifies 90s comics to me, and that is of course Todd McFarlane's Spawn, with Spawn issue 1, cover dated May 1992. 
This is the first appearance of Spawn, of course, but for me, its significance also comes for what it meant to Image Comics and indie comics in, in general in the 90s. Spawn was really the breakout star of Image Comics. Although Spawn number one wasn't the first comic to burst forth from the fledgling Image Comics, that honour belongs to Rob Liefeld's Youngblood issue one, which released a few months earlier. But I think, I think it's fair to say that <laughs> Spawn, um, his popularity has prevailed a lot more than Youngblood. You know, it's crazy to think that the Spawn series starts here in 1992 and we're just about to get the 350th uh, issue and, and Spawn shows no signs of slowing down. So of course this one deserves to be high on the list. Tom McFarlane perpetually teasing us <laughs> with the promise of a Spawn movie has kept this one, you know, high for speculators wanting to make a quick book. But for me, it represents so much more about 90s comics, the, the rise of artists and the rise of independent publishers. So all that remains is number one on this list, what I deem to be the most important comic of the 90s. And you know, when you consider how popular uh, this series was, how popular the character was, um, and just everything surrounding this comic, it shouldn't be a surprise to learn that Amazing Spider-Man issue 361, cover dated April 1992, ranks very highly. And it's purely because of this guy here. This is the first full appearance of Carnage. Comics readers had symbiote fever in the 90s thanks to the popularity of Venom, so when artist Mark Bagley and writer David Michelinie came along and gave us the spawn of Venom, who is a palette swapped scarier, edgier, serial killer version of Venom, <laughs> it really shouldn't be a surprise that Carnage was such a hit. And you have to consider all of Spider-Man's Rose Gallery here, you know, almost all of them go back to the 60s and back to that original Stanley and Steve Ditko run. So for Venom to come in in the 80s and be so popular, and then of course Carnage, it shows what a huge impact these characters had in that decade. What followed was the Maximum Carnage storyline, which was one of the biggest Spider-Man blockbuster events of the 90s, and Cletus Cassidy, aka Carnage, has been a fan favourite ever since, even starring in a Hollywood movie just a couple of years ago. And there we have it, heroes, the 20 most important comics of the 1990s, according to me, but based on a lot of research. I'm curious to know how many of these you own or how many you've read. Let me know down in the comments below. If you want to see more stuff like this, then don't forget to subscribe to Panels to Pixels and give that bell icon a little ring-a-ding-ding -ding so you never miss out on future uploads. As always, stay safe. Don't forget to use my code to sign up to Whatnot, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.